Uh, welcome to the webcast, Advances in the Neurobiological Understanding and Treatment of Insomnia, Focus on Novel Pharmacologic Interventions. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and is supported by an educational grant from Merck and Company Incorporated. I'm Dr. Vladimir Maletic. I'm Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the USC School of Medicine in Greenville, South Carolina, and I will be your presenter today. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, these can also be found on the activity web page. And uh, this is a disclosure about off-label use of uh, melatonin, amitriptyline, trazodone, mirtazapine, olanzapine, catiapine, diphenhydramine, gabapentin, and pregabalin for treatment of insomnia. Our learning objectives, uh, which include description of epidemiology of insomnia and circuits involved in regulation of sleep and wakefulness, as well as discussion of neurotransmitters, which may have a role in regulation of sleep and wakefulness. In addition, we will explain the relationship between insomnia and endocrine, autonomic and immune dysregulation, and outline the relationship between insomnia and multiple psychiatric conditions, as well as uh, a number of different medical conditions which may have strong association with insomnia. Uh, we will also uh, compare and contrast advantages versus limitations of the new and previously available pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions for treatment of insomnia. And finally, we will discuss uh, uh, some new and emerging treatments for insomnia, which are based on uh, different mechanisms of action from the existing medications. So in the beginning, it is probably a good idea to define this condition. Uh, insomnia is characterized by difficulty initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, waking up too early, or having non-restorative or poor quality sleep. Uh, this occurs despite adequate opportunity and circumstances uh, for sleep. There are multiple symptoms which may be associated with, uh, with insomnia, and these include fatigue, alterations in attention and concentration, as well as memory impairment. Um, there can be disturbances in mood, uh, daytime sleepiness, uh, problems with motivation, uh, likelihood of uh, uh, creating uh, errors uh, at work and while driving. Uh, in addition to that, uh, insomnia is an impairing condition and can interfere with one's uh, vocational, academic, and familial functioning. Uh, there are some somatic symptoms that can be associated with insomnia, including uh, tension and headaches and gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, chronic insomnia is defined as insomnia lasting at least three months, uh, present for at least uh, uh, on three days in the course of the week. There are several medication, the types of medications that are commonly used uh, which may interfere with sleep. So uh, multiple antidepressants uh, which increase norepinephrine and serotonin levels, and these include SSRIs and SNRIs, as well as tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, by modulating these monoamines, uh, they can interfere with uh, uh, sleep uh, onset and, and maintenance. Uh, same is the case with stimulants, uh, which include, of course, uh, caffeine, as well as medicines used to treat ADHD, such as uh, methylphenidate and amphetamine derivatives. Uh, there are also medications that can be used to treat common colds, such as uh, pseudoephedrine, ephedrine, and phenylephrine, uh, which can, by modulating monoamines, again, interfere with a sleep pattern. Uh, although not commonly considered problematic, narcotic analgesics, including oxycodone and codeine, uh, can also have detrimental impact on sleep, as well as uh, some cardiovascular medications such as beta blockers and alpha noradrenergic uh, receptor agonists and antagonists. Also, some of the lipid-lowering agents have been known to cause problems with sleep. 
patients taking diuretics have to get up uh, on several occasions during the night in, in order to uh, use the uh, bathroom. And of course, that can interfere with sleep. Some of the pulmonary medications, uh, such as uh, beta agonists, uh, albuterol will be maybe an example, as well as methylxanthines. Uh, so, uh, theophylline is one of those. Uh, this would also be true for caffeine and uh, theobromine in chocolate uh, can be detrimental to sleep. And uh, unfortunately, the most commonly used agent uh, to assist sleep, alcohol, actually has a negative impact on sleep architecture. Insomnia is dramatically underrecognized and undertreated. In a large telephone survey, which included over 2,000 adults over the age of 18, uh, concluded that more than one in four had suffered from insomnia in the previous 12 months. Of the ones who did suffer from insomnia, a majority uh, had chronic insomnia, so it lasted more than a year. Uh, almost 90% of the individuals with insomnia had a chronic form of this condition. Unfortunately, only a minority of those, so uh, less than 15% uh, consulted a physician, and it is even more unfortunate that even if they did consult physician, about half of them did not receive prescription for medication that might assist them uh, with uh, insomnia. While insomnia uh, influences both uh, women and men, it is much more pronounced in female population. So in this large telephone survey, which involved uh, almost 15,000 participants, uh, it was found that uh, insomnia uh, is much more prevalent in female than in male population. The numbers are almost double in females. Um, uh, again, unfortunately, it is most often pronounced uh, and present in uh, its chronic form. So um, majority of the individuals suffering from insomnia uh, have had it uh, in duration of greater than six months and many of them in duration greater than five years. Uh, endocrine factors may have a role in insomnia as well as reproductive status. So we see that uh, uh, prevalence of insomnia in female uh, patients is significantly influenced by menopausal status. It is most pronounced in uh, peri and postmenopause. Uh, this does have clinical uh, relevance as uh, the, the, these are the patients which we, could, we should particularly focus on and inquire about symptoms consistent with presence of insomnia. So this would be women uh, in peri and postmenopause. Uh, when, when I said we should focus on, on symptoms, what might be some of those symptoms? Uh, well, many of our patients will experience fatigue, uh, both early in the morning after they've just woken up and even later in the day. Uh, insomnia is uh, sometimes uh, manifest as problem with attention and concentration. Uh, patients may mention that they have a hard time completing tasks, that they get easily distracted, that they are forgetful. Uh, there can also be changes in mood, uh, bad mood, irritability, hostility, sometimes even aggressive acts can be associated uh, with insomnia. Uh, more uh, rarely, one can also uh, uh, see visual disorders as part of the presentation. We've already mentioned that uh, insomnia may interfere with functioning. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, one of the studies has found that there is uh, those response relationships, so to say. So compared to individuals uh, who have no insomnia, individuals uh, who have insomnia uh, will have more problems uh, with their function, um, and the ones who have severe insomnia will have even greater impairment than individuals who have mild insomnia. Areas of functioning that are particularly negatively influenced include vitality, uh, mental health, and physical functioning. Regulation of sleep and wakefulness is a two-phase process. On one hand, we have a circadian a regulation of sleep and wakefulness. Uh, circadian drive is actually at a relatively uh, low point in the early morning hours. Uh, as uh, 
we get to the mid-morning hours, our wakefulness significantly increase, increases. There is a slight dip in the early afternoon hours, uh, somewhere between uh, 2 and 4, uh, only to be followed by further increase in circadian drive all the way until 9 and 10 o'clock at night. After 11 o'clock at night, circadian drive subsides in preparation for sleep. Uh, in addition to circadian uh, drive, there is also a homeostatic regulation of sleep, of, of sleep and wakefulness. Um, uh, homeostatic uh, uh, regulation is dependent or, on our utilization of energy and duration of wake period. So uh, homeostatic uh, drive is at the low point in the morning. Uh, presumably, we have had a good and restful night. As we engage in more physical activity and intellectual activity and the day goes on, we feel more and more tired and sleepy. Um, there is a physiological basis uh, for homeostatic sleep drive. Uh, we believe that one of the major players is adenosine triphosphate and adenosine. So uh, uh, adenosine uh, phosphorus-rich compounds such as uh, ATP serve as our body's little uh, energy batteries. So the more active we are, uh, the more phosphorus bonds are broken, resulting in release of energy. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, after ATP is degraded to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and then monophosphate, in the end, there is just an accumulation of adenosine. There are cells in the lateral hypothalamus that have exquisite sensitivity to accumulation of adenosine. When it reaches certain concentration, it shuts down these lateral hypothalamic neurons. Um, under physiological circumstances, these neurons release orexin or hypocretin. Uh, orexin has a role in maintaining wakefulness and stabilizing wakefulness. Therefore, when we have had a really busy day with great energy expenditure, towards the end of the day, accumulated adenosine will shut down these uh, uh, wakefulness-promoting and stabilizing neurons, and we will feel considerable sleepiness. In addition to uh, homeostatic drive and circadian drive, uh, we also uh, need to address the relationship between suprachiasmatic nucleus, our body's central clock, and uh, light cycle. There is a relationship, and it is mediated by two compounds. Uh, one is called melanopsin. Uh, during the light cycle, uh, light, particularly the light of uh, uh, blue-green frequency, influences the receptors in retina, resulting in secretion of melanopsin. Melanopsin promotes wakefulness. Uh, when the light cycle changes and we're in the dark period, melanopsin uh, release decreases. Now, uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus has a different pattern of activity. It is synchronized uh, uh, with periventricular nucleus, which is one of the main endocrine hubs in the brain. It is responsible for the function of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, for example. It is also synchronized with superior cervical ganglia. This is the hub of autonomic system. And the circuit, of course, includes pineal gland. Uh, pineal gland is source of synthesis and secretion of melatonin. Uh, melatonin uh, shuts down or changes the function of suprachiasmatic nucleus, shuts it down in the sense that uh, wakefulness is declining while uh, propensity towards sleep is increasing. Uh, we also have to be aware that uh, melatonin levels change dramatically with age. So if we take uh, years uh, 5 to 10 as a reference point, by the time uh, we are 60, our melatonin secretion has been reduced by 80%. Uh, this may be one of the reasons that uh, elderly population is uh, uh, particularly sensitive to, to sleep disturbances. And um, uh, we can also extrapolate and suggest that uh, in elderly people, uh, light cycle or having lights at night uh, may be of, of significant hindrance. Uh, speaking about uh, circadian rhythms, it's not only sleep and wakefulness. It is also related to secretion of hormones and uh, norepinephrine. So we see that uh, in early morning hours between 6 and 7, 
there is a substantial increase in release of norepinephrine, but also cortisol. Uh, together, they assist in uh, precipitating wakefulness. Uh, yeah. In addition to that, melatonin is shut off. So after 7.30 in the morning, there's very little uh, uh, melatonin secreted. About 10 o'clock, we have peak alertness. About 2.30 uh, uh, p.m. is the best time to be engaged in activities uh, necessitating good coordination. Uh, we see that uh, when it comes to high blood pressure and cardiovascular function, it has two peaks. One is in the morning between 6 and 7. The other one is in the evening, 6 to 7. Uh, not surprisingly, these are actually the peak time for heart attacks as well, as it is uh, the time when uh, decompensated heart function is most likely to be manifest. Around 9 o'clock is the time when melatonin secretion uh, starts again. So again, we see that many bodily processes are on this uh, clock and tethered to our circadian rhythm. Uh, speaking about uh, sleep and wakefulness, uh, while these are interrelated processes, uh, there are some elements that are quite discrete. So we'll spend a few minutes first discussing uh, neural sleep promoting pathways. Um, one of the key areas uh, for in initiation of sleep and maintenance of sleep is ventral lateral preoptic area and hypothalamus. Uh, neurons in this brain area um, uh, release GABA and galanine. Uh, these mediators have a role in shutting down many of the wakefulness promoting areas. So GABA and galanine will suppress uh, activity of brainstem monoamine nuclei. They will also alter the activity of uh, lateral dorsal tegmentum and pedicolopontin tegmental area acetylcholine uh, neurons and, and will uh, contribute to shutting down tubermammillary nucleus histamine neurons, which are intimately involved with maintenance of wakefulness. We will now spend a few minutes uh, looking at pathways uh, whose primary role is to maintain wakefulness. Uh, and they include uh, brainstem monoamine nuclei, including locus ceruleus, norepinephrine neurons, uh, serotonin neurons from uh, nuclei rafe, uh, ventral tegmental area dopamine uh, neurons, as well as two cholinergic nuclei, uh, lateral dorsal tegmental area and pedicolopontin uh, uh, tegmentum. Uh, all, of, uh, all of these uh, uh, nuclei uh, are assisting with uh, uh, ascending reticular activating system in maintenance of uh, wakefulness. One of the reasons uh, why individuals may suffer from insomnia is disturbed regulation of arousal. Uh, imaging studies uh, support this notion. We see that in patients suffering from insomnia, uh, certain brain areas that are supposed to deactivate at night do not. Uh, what are some of those uh, inappropriately active brain areas? Well, not only do they include ascending reticular activating system and hypothalamus, but they also include uh, uh, middle temporal uh, areas such as uh, amygdala and hippocampus uh, involved in fight or flight response and its regulation, as well as some of the paralimbic areas such as cingulate cor cortex and insular cortex which are intimately involved in regulation of uh, stress response and emotions. So it appears that uh, activity in the brain of individuals who are suffering of insomnia is in fight or flight pattern. On the other hand, uh, there is an aberrant uh, type of activity noted the next day. So while ascending reticular activating system actually has decreased activity in the morning, in individuals suffering from insomnia. It can be also noted that prefrontal cortical areas involved with working memory, executive function, and attention have diminished activity. Uh, this is, uh, of course, of, of particular concern as uh, dysfunction of these brain areas may have significant impact on ability to function at work and function socially. Uh, uh, we also see that uh, even in healthy individuals, um, activity in ventromedial prefrontal cortex is associated with level of sleepiness 
in this particular study measured by using effort sleepiness scale. It is interesting that uh, uh, structural imaging studies of individuals uh, suffering from insomnia have noted that uh, there is a change in gray matter volume in this particular area, uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex also uh, sends a regulatory fibers to brainstem, therefore has substantial role in influencing the activity of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin nuclei. Uh, therefore, um, there may be uh, a pathophysiologic link between uh, mood disturbances and uh, maintenance of wakefulness and energy in individuals uh, suffering from insomnia. Uh, other structural and functional studies uh, have uh, noted a relationship between uh, duration of insomnia and volume of hippocampus. Now, um, not only is this uh, of interest to us because uh, a loss of volume in this key brain area can be problematic, but also because uh, uh, we know that hippocampus has a role in short-term memory, especially declarative memory and spatial memory, as well in, in, in endocrine regulation. Uh, therefore, it is not a, a great surprise to find that in insomnia patients, along with diminished hippocampal volume, we can see that there is alteration in the level of arousal. Uh, of course, uh, with change in uh, function of these key limbic and paralimbic areas, uh, that is very mindful with fight or flight response. Uh, we have to be concerned about bodily manifestations of chronic insomnia. And indeed, uh, evidence suggests that uh, insomnia sufferers do have altered autonomic function. There is a tendency towards increased sympathetic tone and decreased sympathetic tone, as well as change in uh, cortisol signaling. Uh, altogether, uh, these signals are delivered to immune cells. So there is excessive uh, activation of uh, uh, sympathetic receptors, uh, um, adrenaline, uh, alpha, and beta receptors, primarily alpha, as well as decline in activation of parasympathetic cholinergic receptors, uh, primarily nicotinic receptors on immune cells. Uh, this kind of disbalance uh, results in inappropriate activation of a compound that is called nuclear factor kappa beta or kappa B. Uh, nuclear factor kappa B is a transcription factor that regulates synthesis of inflammatory cytokines. Therefore, uh, persistent insomnia may be associated with abnormal immune signaling and a, a tendency towards excessive inflammation. Insomnia also has an association with hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, dysregulation. Uh, we see that compared to in the individuals who are healthy controls, uh, patients suffering from insomnia have a different pattern of cortisol secretion. Uh, this pattern is particularly pronounced uh, between 9 o'clock at night uh, uh, until shortly after midnight. Uh, during that period, there is an increase in cortisol secretion, which well may interfere with sleep onset as well as sleep maintenance. Uh, this is, a, a, frankly, a particularly ominous physiological signal as uh, uh, so-called flattening of the cortisol curve, much like it is noticed in insomnia, is a negative predictor in many other medical conditions. Uh, so individuals who have a flat cortisol curve and are suffering from depression may not respond well to antidepressant treatments. If one has flattening of cortisol curve and is suffering from MI or chronic heart failure, uh, this is a predictor of death in those patients. In can cancer patients, uh, a flat cortisol curve has an association with uh, risk for metastases. So again, it is an invariably negative uh, physiological signal. In addition to uh, disturbance in endocrine function, patients suffering from insomnia may have uh, disturbance in uh, autonomic function. And therefore, we see that in patients experiencing insomnia, uh, compared to uh, healthy controls and even depressed patients, uh, they tend to have uh, higher levels of nocturnal norepinephrine. Uh, this elevated norepinephrine in the evening 
also may be hypothetically associated uh, with hyperarousal, difficulty falling asleep, and uh, uh, maybe even sleep fragmentation in the course of the night. Are there melatonin uh, changes in individuals suffering from insomnia? Uh, research suggests so. So uh, compared to healthy controls, uh, insomnia patients uh, tend to have diminished uh, melatonin levels between 11.30 at night and 3.30 a.m. So uh, during that time, uh, decline in melatonin secretion may also have repercussions on uh, sleep onset and uh, further sleep maintenance. Uh, we have mentioned that there is a relationship between insomnia and immune function. Um, this has been studied. Um, uh, one of the major inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6, appears to have different levels in insomnia patients compared to healthy controls. So we see that there is an ele elevation of inflammatory signaling uh, between hours of 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. This is very unusual because inflammatory cytokines should actually peak uh, right around midnight and after midnight. Uh, what might be some of the clinical correlates of increased inflammatory signaling? Well, many of the patients suffering from insomnia will report during the day feeling sluggish, their mind feels foggy, they have hard time focusing, hard time completing tasks, they get easily distracted. Also, they're not particularly in the mood to socialize, may feel a little bit uh, irritable uh, or anx anxious and tense. Uh, many of these symptoms may be actually associated with inappropriate increase in inflammatory signaling in the morning hours. So we see that uh, insomnia can precipitate increased inflammatory signaling. The question is, can good sleep restore some of the appropriate immune function? Uh, the study that we're uh, um, looking at now has made a correlation between plasma levels of interleukin-6, one of the main inflammatory cytokines, and sleep efficiency. Uh, sleep efficiency is relationship between time spent in bed versus time uh, spent asleep. So, for example, if one needs to stay in bed for 10 hours in order to achieve 8 hours of sleep, sleep efficiency is 80%. In healthy individuals, uh, sleep efficiency should be above 85%. Um, um, this particular study has noted that higher sleep efficiency tends to be associated with decreased inflammatory response. So uh, clearly a, a good reason uh, to work on establishing this healthy sleep pattern as we can. If insomnia is associated to, with uh, inappropriately high levels of inflammation, but also disturbance in autonomic and endocrine function, uh, do these patients have increased risk of other medical condition? Uh, the finding um, of the paper published by Taylor and colleagues uh, definitely suggests so. Uh, so we see that this in epidemiological study, uh, which had over 500 participants, demonstrated a strong relationship between insomnia and risk for various other medical conditions. So having in insomnia uh, more than doubles the likelihood of uh, comorbid heart disease it is associated with almost a fourfold increase in risk of respiratory problems and threefold increase in risk for hypertension or chronic pain. Uh, insomnia also has multiple psychiatric comorbidities. So in a study that included over 800 individuals, it was noted that individuals who suffer from insomnia relative uh, to patients who had no sleep complaints had a dramatic increase in prevalence of a number of different psychiatric disorders. Uh, in the first place, uh, anxiety disorders have doubled the rate individuals suffering from insomnia versus ones who have no uh, sleep complaints. It is also associated with more than tenfold increased risk of uh, association with depression. It is fourfold uh, increased risk of presence of dysthymia and at least double uh, the likelihood of having alcohol use or drug abuse. Which brings up a very interesting question. Uh, 
and it is uh, chicken uh, versus egg uh, type of discussion. What comes first? So uh, we see that this is actually an asymmetrical relationship. Uh, individuals who suffer uh, from uh, depression are much more likely to have insomnia as a precipitant of depression uh, than vice versa, depression precipitating insomnia. So insomnia causes depression more than depression causes insomnia. Uh, this is very different when it comes to anxiety disorders. And uh, as anxiety disorders have stronger association with insomnia than insomnia has with onset of anxiety disorders. Uh, thus, presence of insomnia have clinical implications in patients suffering from major depressive disorder. Uh, very much so. As a matter of fact, presence of insomnia uh, has very strong uh, association with emergence of suicidal ideation. Uh, it may be surprising, but uh, relationship between insomnia and suicidal ideation uh, is pretty much double as association with uh, duration of depression and suicidal ideation. Again, uh, uh, much to our surprise, uh, insomnia is a stronger, much stronger uh, a predictor of suicidality than duration of depression itself. Uh, there are uh, multiple uh, pharmacologic interventions available to us uh, for treatment of insomnia. Uh, we see that uh, most frequently used and FDA-approved agents uh, for treatment of insomnia are in benzodiazepine receptor modulating category. These are also so-called Z drugs, and they include esulpicone, uh, zolpidem, and uh, zaloplon. So uh, are there some differences between these medications? Uh, well, yes, uh, as zolpicone, uh, can be used in, uh, not only for uh, treatment induction, but also for treat, uh, treatment maintenance as it has a longer uh, duration of activity. On the other hand, uh, Zolpidem, depending on its formulation, it, in immediate re release form, it is primarily used for sleep induction. On the other hand, its extended release uh, formulation can be also utilized for sleep maintenance. Uh, Zeloplon um, in uh, 5 and 10 milligram uh, doses uh, is uh, mostly used for uh, sleep initiation. Uh, on occasion, it is also uh, for individuals who have interrupted sleep because it may assist them in falling asleep uh, more readily. There are several benzodiazepine agents uh, which have been uh, used in treatment of insomnia, and uh, these include estazolam and temazepam, triazolam, and fluorazepam. Uh, in using these agents, uh, we have to be concerned about the balance between benefit and uh, a possible adverse reactions. In terms of uh, duration of activity, uh, many of these agents uh, on the short end will act for about eight hours. Uh, several of them will actually have life that is as long as 20 to 24 hours. Probably the extreme is fluorazepam, which has half-life uh, almost uh, uh, of almost 10 days. Uh, why can this be of concern? Because uh, uh, these agents, uh, along, uh, aside from being hypnotic agents, uh, can also influence energy levels the next day and can contribute to somnolence, uh, sense of fatigue next day, and impairment in cognitive function. So we have to very carefully weigh uh, the benefits uh, versus uh, potential detriments in using these medications. Uh, one of the melatonin receptor modulating medicines, uh, Ramaltion, is also approved by FDA for use in treatment of insomnia. Uh, Ramaltion is both melatonin 1 and melatonin 2 receptor agonist. It has uh, a very short half-life of uh, only about two and a half hours, and therefore, uh, uh, has a little bit different safety profile from benzodiazepine or benzodiazepine receptor modulating agents. Um, 
although it is not FDA approved as medication, melatonin is very commonly used in treatment of insomnia. Uh, much like remelteon, uh, uh, melatonin is melatonin 1 and melatonin 2 receptor agonist. Uh, uh, its uh, effect size is quite moderate uh, based on many of the studies, somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3, meaning only mild to moderate uh, efficacy at best. Uh, several antidepressants are commonly used in treatment of insomnia. Uh, these include doxepin, amitriptyline, and trazodone. Although they are very frequently used, aside from doxepin, which actually does have an FDA indication in treatment for insomnia, amitriptyline and trazodone do not have a robust evidence base supporting their use. Um, uh, doxepin uh, dose used in treatment of insomnia is very different than antidepressant dose. It is in the low range, between 3 and 6 milligrams, while its uh, dosing in treatment of depression and anxiety is 10 to 100 milligram range. Uh, in the lower uh, uh, end of, of dosing spectrum, um, which is appropriate, for insomnia uh, uh, treatment. Uh, this medicine is actually relatively well tolerated. In the higher doses utilized to treat depression and anxiety, one has to be uh, concerned by anticholinergic effects, but also alpha-1 antagonism. Uh, two other antidepressants uh, which are used uh, commonly in treatment of sleep disturbances, amitriptyline and trazodone, along with being serotonin 2A antagonist and uh, antimuscarinic agents are also alpha-1 norepinephrine receptor antagonist. The concerns with this pharmacologic profile along with inducing sleepiness, uh, it can be associated also with changes in regulation of blood pressure. It is of particular concern that they may bring on orthostatic hypotension. Our patients may get dizzy and fall, and also anticholinergic uh, effects, which include dry mouth, the urinary difficulties, constipation, uh, blurry vision. Uh, alpha-1 antagonism has also been associated with priapism. Another uh, antidepressant that is uh, not uncommonly used to assist with treatment of insomnia is mirtazapine. Uh, in addition to some of the uh, receptor activities that have been mentioned, uh, uh, mirtazapine, through its uh, robust impact on histamine 1 receptors, may also uh, precipitate changes in appetite and, and weight gain. So we have to be uh, uh, very careful in using these medicines. And uh, uh, in my mind, their most appropriate use would be in patients who already suffer from depression, uh, where uh, their side effects can actually be used maybe to assist with consolidation of sleep. What are some of the non-pharmacologic interventions that have uh, proven efficacy in treatment of insomnia? Uh, well, these include uh, sleep hygiene. Uh, we need to point out to our, our patients that it is in their interest to have a fixed sleep and wakefulness schedule. Of course, we cannot request perfection, but going uh, to bed at approximately the same time and waking up at the same time can uh, go long ways towards having good, healthy sleep pattern. Uh, it is also a good idea to... <clears throat> uh, uh, advise our patients about uh, the most sleep conducive bedroom settings. So it is good to eliminate any kind of bright lights or, or noise, and it is of particular importance to have comfortable uh, sleeping temperature. If our patients uh, have a hard time relaxing, uh, maybe having a warm shower uh, before going to bed can be helpful. It is also a good idea to avoid caffeine and nicotine at least six hours before bedtime because they can interfere with sleep onset. Um, although uh, people will commonly uh, drink alcoholic beverages in order to help with their sleep, it actually has a detrimental impact on sleep architecture and therefore it's a good idea to avoid alcohol at least four hours before bedtime. Although exercise in the afternoon uh, can be helpful and can support sleep, it's probably not a good idea to exercise immediately before going to bed because increased arousal that accompanies exercise can be an impediment. So it's probably a good idea not to have vigorous exercise two to four hours before bedtime. Also, uh, uh, there can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, many of our patients who have a hard time uh, falling asleep 
are repetitively looking at the clocks and getting more and more frustrated they are not already asleep. Uh, this is not a good practice and we should advise against it. Um, one of the very helpful practices is having stimulus control. It is very simple. It boils down to uh, go to bed only when you're sleepy. Uh, many of our patients actually condition themselves uh, uh, to where they feel like bedroom is an aversive environment when it comes to sleep. So if one associates tossing and turning and not being able to sleep to being in bed and being in bedroom, uh, it makes it harder to fall asleep appropriately. So uh, the suggestion is if they have hard time falling asleep, and uh, if it is more than 15 or 20 minute a latency until sleep time, they should probably leave the bedroom, go elsewhere, and only return when they're ready to go to sleep. Uh, napping during the day can be a problematic practice, uh, especially long naps, because uh, they can interfere with uh, sleep onset. It is also wise to avoid uh, watching TV, uh, reading, or sitting in front of the laptop computers, as uh, some of the uh, light that is emitted by these devices can actually interfere with uh, uh, secretion of melatonin and regulation of sleep onset. Uh, sleep restriction uh, can be also a, a useful technique. Um, it is a relatively simple principle. Uh, let us start with only limited time in bed and make sure that patients sleep most of this time. Uh, if the, indeed their uh, sleep efficiency is very uh, high, one can actually increase uh, 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 time spent in bed. On the other hand, if uh, sleep efficiency is low, one can actually decrease the time spent in bed. Although it is uh, very much underutilized, uh, CBT uh, can be particularly helpful in uh, treatment of insomnia. Uh, very often, it is referred to ICBT, and one can also find uh, numerous uh, uh, apps uh, available uh, that may assist our patients uh, with ICBT. Uh, what is the evidentiary base uh, supporting CBT use? Well, uh, one can see that CBT can be helpful when it comes to reduction of sleep uh, onset latency and also using some objective measures uh, such as wake after sleep onset, we see that it can improve with utilization of, of CBT. Uh, additionally, uh, CBT can impact uh, uh, a subjective measure such as total sleep time, but also an objective measure such as uh, sleep efficiency, uh, which as I've mentioned is the ratio between time spent in bed versus time spent uh, asleep. Uh, studies have uh, followed a long-term impact of uh, CBT on uh, biological parameters associated with insomnia. So in this particular study, uh, one monitored the impact of CBT on inflammation. And uh, the finding was that unlike sleep seminar, which had no benefit in decreasing inflammatory signaling, both Tai Chi and CBT uh, temporarily reduced inflammation. Uh, a remarkable finding was that uh, unlike uh, uh, the impact of, of uh, Tai Chi on inflammation um, here uh, reflected in levels of C-reactive protein, which seemed to be transient. As soon as Tai Chi practice ceased, uh, inflammation returned to the previous levels. In individuals who had uh, CBT uh, for a period of four months, even after cessation of CBT, there was an enduring impact on reducing insomnia in the, I'm sorry, reducing uh, inflammation in insomnia patients. Finally, uh, there are some novel mechanisms uh, that are being uh, utilized. Uh, um, uh, agents have been developed uh, to act on orexin receptors. Uh, before we go into discussion of the orexin receptor uh, pharmacology, it is good to uh, point out that there are two compounds, uh, orexin A and orexin B. 
While orexin A interacts with both orexin 1 and orexin 2 receptors, uh, orexin B uh, selectively binds to orexin 2 receptors. Uh, what is the, the relevance of this kind of selectivity and relevance of, of having uh, uh, different types of uh, receptors where there are slightly different roles of orexin receptors 1 versus orexin receptors 2? Uh, orexin uh, receptors uh, 1 will uh, primarily impact on the function of locus aureus. So therefore, they're much more involved in regulation of arousal. As opposed to that, orexin receptors, too, uh, have more to do with regulation of tuber mammillary nucleus in hypothalamus and therefore regulation of histamine signaling, um, uh, very much important for maintenance of wakefulness. Orexin-2 receptors, in addition, are also uh, involved in modulation of glutamate signa signaling via NMDA receptors. Uh, again, therefore, modulation of orexin A and orexin B signaling through orexin 1 and 2 receptors would, uh, uh, to a significant degree, impact on wakefulness and arousal levels. This may be of uh, particular benefit to uh, some of our insomnia patients where uh, uh, absence of, of sleep drive is not so much an issue as uh, inappropriate arousal levels. Uh, so how did subarexant, one of the uh, orexin-1 and orexin-2 inhibiting agents perform? Well, uh, here we see measures on subjective uh, parameters uh, related to sleep. So this is uh, subjective total sleep time and subjective time to sleep onset. And we see that starting from day one, so uh, virtually as soon as the medicine was utilized, there was improvement in total sleep time as well as time to sleep onset. Therefore, both uh, sleep induction and, and, and sleep maintenance reflected by these subjective parameters seems to have improved after the usage of superaccent. Um, additionally, we find out that uh, not only does subarexant improve sleep based on subjective measures, such as uh, uh, total sleep time and time to sleep onset, but uh, also objective findings uh, reflected in change of awake after sleep onset and latency to persistent sleep. So one is a measure of sleep maintenance, the other is sleep onset, uh, is improved first night, uh, uh, first month, first week, but also three months after initiation of treatment. So all these sleep parameters uh, dramatically improved with the utilization of medicine. Now we see that uh, uh, doses of subarexant uh, differ in these studies. In some studies, uh, 20 milligram was used, dose was used in adult patients, while 15 milligram dose was used in patients 65 and above, while in other, uh, 40 milligrams was used in adult patients and 30 milligrams in uh, population 65 and above. It is good to point out at this time that uh, only subarexant doses up to 20 milligrams are FDA approved, 40 and 30 milligrams are not part of the current labeling. But again, they both seem to have uh, clear efficacy. Whenever we speak about efficacy, we of course have to be aware that there may be detriments associated with use in medication. So if uh, uh, we utilize uh, FDA definition of what is a common adverse reaction, common being uh, greater than 5% and double the rate of placebo, there is only one adverse reaction associated with subarexin that would meet FDA criteria. Uh, for common, and that is somnolence. It was present in 3% of the patients treated with placebo in registration trials uh, versus 6.7% of the patients who were treated with subarexant uh, 15 and 20 milligrams. <clears throat> Just to remind you, these are the FDA-approved doses. A uh, number needed to harm when it comes to this particular adverse reaction, somnolence, was 13. In plain English, one would need to to treat uh, with higher doses of a subarexant, 13 patients, in order to have one person develop somnolence. When it comes to uh, doses that are FDA approved, 
such as 15 and 20 milligrams, number needed to harm is 28. So again, 28 patients treated with Zuvorexin in order to produce one person with somnolence that would not be perceived with placebo. Uh, other adverse reactions uh, seen in a lower uh, percentage of patients included headache, uh, dizziness, uh, abnormal dreams. Again, uh, there was no significant differentiation between medication and uh, placebo when it comes to these effects. Uh, um, this also includes dry mouth. When it comes to nausea, the rate was actually lower in medicine than on placebo, and uh, impact on fatigue or upper respiratory infection was, again, non-significant. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, insomnia is very prevalent. It is also often underdiagnosed, and unfortunately, even when it is diagnosed, it remains undertreated. Uh, insomnia shares pathophysiology with many psychiatric conditions. Uh, it is important to recognize that insomnia is not only a symptom of other psychiatric and medical conditions. It is a bona fide uh, uh, entity and requires uh, separate treatment uh, from its comorbidities. Some of the more common uh, causes of insomnia include uh, either inadequate sleep drive or excessive arousal, which interferes with sleep onset and maintenance. And um, in the end, in uh, considering various treatment options for insomnia, it is a good idea to keep in mind that uh, while we always uh, uh, desire uh, con uh, impressive sleep efficacy, it is also a good idea to take into consideration uh, addictive potential, uh, adverse reactions, and interference with the daytime functioning. Uh, so at this point, uh, I want to thank you on your kind participation and uh, to conclude this presentation. Thank you very much. This concludes our program. Participants should complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit. Thank you for your participation in this activity.